Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. This is John. I am the event coordinator at Murder by the Book. And if you have been tuning into these virtual events, you will realize that I actually have a different background. I'm actually at the bookstore today. So for those of you who have never been to the bookstore, welcome. Here is a, a quick view of the American section behind us. Um, but before we go, um, before we bring out today's author, as I just want to let everybody know a little bit about what's going on with us. Um, we're still doing a mix of in-store and virtual events. Uh, last night, we had Chris Pavone here to talk about his new book, Two Nights in Lisbon. Uh, tomorrow, we're really excited. Tomorrow night at 7 p.m., we'll be chatting with James Lee Burke. Uh, he'll be in conversation with Ace Atkins. Um, and... Um, so when you're looking at the store's event calendar, you're gonna see things listed either as in-store or virtual. Um, also wanted to mention, um, we, are, we were supposed to have um, uh, Joel Schwartz in store on Saturday. He's had a death in the family, so we're working on rescheduling his event as soon as we get new dates about his, um, or new dates for his event, we will get those blasted out so everybody can check those out. Um, so I think that is it. I'm going to get us right into it today. We're really excited to be chatting with Catherine Miles and Ellen McGarrahan. I'm going to bring Catherine out first. How are you this afternoon, Catherine? I'm well, thank you. How are you? We're doing well. Thanks for joining us. So Catherine's new book, Trailed, One Woman's Quest to Solve the Shenandoah Murders, came out on May 3rd. Uh, Catherine is the author of five books. Her essays and articles have appeared in publications such as Audubon, Best American Essays, Best American Sports Writing, uh, The Boston Globe, The New York Times, Outside, Politico, and Time. A contributing editor at Down East Magazine, she also serves as a scholar in residence for the Maine Humanities Council and as a faculty member in several MFA programs. And like I said, her newest book, Trailed, has just come out. And um, while she and Ellen are chatting this evening, if you guys have questions for either of them, you can post those in the live chat on YouTube or the comments on Facebook, and we will leave some time to get to those. And uh, next, we're going to bring out Ellen McGarrahan. How are you tonight, Ellen? I'm really well. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. So Ellen was telling us before we went live that she is joining us from London. So we really appreciate you burning the midnight oil to chat with us this evening. I'm so glad to be here. Thank you. Um, Ellen's um, book, uh, Two Truths and a Lie, A Murder, A Private Investigator, and Her Search for Justice came out um, last February. Uh, Ellen McGarrahan earned a degree in history from Yale and worked as an investigative reporter at newspapers in New York City, Boston, Miami, and San Francisco before accidentally finding her calling as a private detective. Uh, for two decades, her investigations agency has specialized in complex civil and criminal cases, ranging from corporate whistleblowing to capital murder. Her first book, True Truths and a Lie, A Murder, A Private Investigator, and her search for justice was published by Random House in February of 2021. It was named a New York Times uh, Book Review Editor's Choice and was a finalist for Best Fact Crime Category for the 2022 Edgars from the Mystery Writers of America. Um, as I mentioned, if you guys have questions for either of them this evening, please post those in the comments. But for now, Catherine and Ellen, I'm going to turn it over to you guys and we'll see you in just a little bit. Thank you. Thank you. So it's, it's so amazing to talk with you, Kate. Thank you. I feel the same way. <laughs> I was just totally fangirling before we went on. So um, it's just really wonderful. And and I was, as I was saying before, you know, your book is just so remarkable in so many different ways. And I really just identified with your approach and the depth of your investigation and everything else like that. So I, I feel already like I'm talking to a friend, which feels great. Yeah, it, I, I feel exactly the same way. And when I, I read your book, I was really amazed at the work that you did and the way that you told the story and the empathy that you had for the the people that you wrote about, the the women who were um, sadly are at the center of the story. And it just I, I felt like such a resonance with the the way that it's the way that you had to get inside the story. And I really wanted to be able to talk to you after reading the book. And so here we are. I think that's really exciting. Um, and I just want to mention that, um, I don't know, it's here. It's really incredible. Um, you've got this amazing blurb from John Grisham, <laughs> which is incredible. It's right there. Um, it says, it's a beautifully written account of a great American tragedy. I couldn't put it down. I couldn't possibly have put that better. I mean, that's just such an amazing, amazing thing. Um, and actually, I was hoping that we could start with talking about the, the case that you investigated and what brought you to it. And I just wanted to say that I am one of the people who many, many, many of us actually know about this case. Mm -hmm. It's something that happened in, is it 1996? Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, like a, a quarter, how many, that's a quarter of a century ago. And, you know, when I 
heard about your book, I thought, wow, I, I remember that. So it's really, really resonant. And it's something that I think um, many of us have carried mm. and about without really knowing it. And so um, I would love it if you could just tell us what, what the story is and what brought you to it. And, um, and uh, I guess then maybe talk about what your experience was in, in doing the work. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. And, you know, there were a spate actually of these double homicides that occurred on or very near the Appalachian Trail um, from the late 1980s into the early to mid 1990s. And I think for for those of us of a certain age, I'm 47, you know, for, for my generation, I think it really, these really did leave a really indelible mark on us and, and really, I think, radically changed how many people, especially people who identify as women or non-binary or LGBTQ, approach the wilderness. And so I think, you know, that residual effect that you were talking about is remarkably common. And I've been really amazed at how many people, you know, have come up to me after an event or contacted me and said, you know, I remember these crimes and it was the last time I felt safe in the wilderness. Or I remember these crimes and I haven't gone camping or backpacking since. And so that that kind of residual effect, I think, is really real. Um, but to just sort of briefly outline the case, um, it involves two really remarkable young women, Julie Williams and Lolly Winans. And they had met in May of 1995. They were both working as trip leaders at this really remarkable organization called Woods Women, which was this sort of um, female centric, holistic approach to wilderness expeditions that was created as kind of a corrective to the more standard models that you would see in a place like Outward Bound or the National Outdoor Leadership School. And um, Lolly and Julie had both arrived there with a, a really sort of articulated love of, of wilderness and what we now call adventure therapy and a real desire to kind of work in that field. And, um, you know, one of the things I really wanted to do in the book is make sure that they were very present and remained the main characters in the book throughout because they, they were just in their very short lives had already done such remarkable things and were very just sort of social justice conscious had, you know, really already kind of left a mark doing things and were just really great humans too. Mm -hmm. um, they met and, and fell almost immediately in love um, and, and spent that summer in a very sort of safe place where a same sex relationship felt like an okay thing to do. And I think it's really important also to remember sort of the, the times of the mid nineties when, you know, being LGBTQ was not anywhere close really to being acceptable. And, you know, whatever hurdles exist today were exponentially greater then, mm -hmm. um, but, but did really have this really wonderful love affair that I also wanted to pay homage to. Um, and after a, a school year had kind of separated them and prompted a long distance relationship, the two had decided to um, move in together for the summer and embark upon what was supposed to be just a really easy 10 day backpacking trip in Shenandoah National Park, um, where they were really in their element um, and kind of knew all the best practices and rules to do. And yet, um, even having established this very sort of secret hidden campsite in the backcountry in the park were really brutally murdered and what was a really sophisticated crime. And, and so in the book, I, I try to you know, have these multiple threads, one of which is telling the story of Lolly and Julie, um, telling the story of this crime and, and why the investigation was so difficult and fraught and remains difficult and fraught. And then, as you said, kind of my, my personal connection and the process that I went through, you know, for what were really kind of four and a half years and are in some ways really kind of ongoing with my own investigation. Yeah. So tell me how you came to this story. I first learned of the story very shortly after it um, happened. As I say in the book, like Lolly and Julie, I was also a sexual assault survivor who had found a lot of kind of healing through backpacking. And I had come to backpacking in the um, fall of 1995, 1994. So right around the exact same time that all of this was happening. Um, mm -hmm. I graduated from college in the spring of 96, actually on the same weekend that we think the two women were murdered. Wow. I didn't learn about the story until two years later when I was doing a section hike on the Appalachian Trail and had learned about this and some of those other crimes that I had alluded to earlier. And 
even in that moment, I was a graduate student, you know, I, it was inconceivable to me that that violence could occur in what I had already come to believe was the sacred space. Mm -hmm. And so learning about that and learning that, you know, people who looked and acted and seemed a whole lot like me, but were actually even more experienced in the backcountry, that they could be murdered doing what I so loved was a really life changing moment for me. And I, and I don't use that lightly. It, it really impacted and affected how I experienced the wilderness. And so then a few years later, by utter coincidence, I ended up teaching um, as a professor of environmental studies at um, the same small college that Lolly had been attending uh, when she was murdered. And so being in that small community where she was still so present and where, you know, her friends had become my friends, her professors had become my colleagues, um, was really impactful. And then, um, you know, when an individual was indicted for the crime in 2002, that really brought the national media attention back to the college. And I saw firsthand just like what that kind of microscopic scrutiny felt like too. Wow. Um, that sounds like a, it sounds like you were living it for a while, actually. If you if you came to it, you know, such a long time before you ended up investigating it yourself. So how did that how did the book come about? Yeah. And so I had um, by 2016, I had left Unity College and was writing mostly full time. I still do a little bit of part time teaching, um, but was mostly writing. And at the time I was working as the trail correspondent for Outside Magazine. Mm -hmm. 2016 was the 20th anniversary of this murder. And the FBI made a very public sort of national push for information on this case. Um, and at that point, I had the same reaction that I think a lot of people did was which was, wait a minute, like somebody was indicted for this in 2002. I assumed that there had been a trial and justice had been served and the person was in prison and we were all safe. And so I had some questions going in about it, you know, when in thinking I was going to be writing a fairly easy feature story, um, following the guise of what the FBI had been very explicit in telling me, which was like, no, 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 we're, we're really pretty sure we got the guy. We just need a little bit more evidence to really kind of close this case. The individual in question, Daryl Rice, had been indicted in 2002. His indictment was dismissed in 2005, but it was dismissed using a legal concept called uh, without prejudice, which basically meant that the prosecution could and still can bring the case back against him at any time. So, so that was kind of my, my entree into the story. And, and I, I really kind of went along initially with what the FBI had been telling me about the fact that it really was rice. They just needed a little bit more evidence to make sure that the prosecution was going to be successful. And I thought that was the story that I was writing. And it was only when I started doing my own digging that I realized that there was virtually, which is to say, I think no case against rice. And that meanwhile, this investigation had been, you know, mishandled, you know, some cases I think intentionally misdirected and, and how it is that we got to this point. So that became the sort of surprise for me that I wasn't expected. And it, that's when this really became a book. And what was the, what was the turning point there? What was the, when you, when you, um, when you started looking into it and then... Well, I had a I had a research assistant who was um, a law student who was specializing in criminal law. And um, it was a really big, I think, education for me initially to kind of work through criminal law that had not been something I had really covered as a journalist, except for the sort of scientific component of it. I had done some work on forensics and, and things like that. Um, so she and I would meet and she was helping me navigate all of these legal documents that were really pretty new to me. And we would always sort of check in at each meeting. And I would always say, you know, what percentage chance is it, do you think that he did it? And initially we were like 90, 80, you know, we were really certain. And then we finally got access to all the discovery documents that had um, been generated while the, while the case was still active in the, in the federal court system. And we flew down to Virginia and, and went through these boxes. And you know, seeing just how little, you know, there was one piece of circumstantial evidence that the prosecution had and realizing that that was literally all that the that the um, 
American government had to pursue what was the first federal hate crime in the country. You know, I remember very vividly walking out of the clerk's office at the end of the day and waiting for the elevator and turning to my research assistant and saying, you know, what, what percent chance today? And she kind of shrugged and she was like, I don't know, 20, 25. And I was like, exactly in the same place. And that was when I thought, okay, wait a minute, you know, there's, there's more to this story. And, um, why, why is the FBI, why, why is the federal government so convinced that this person for whom they have next to no evidence is, is clearly guilty? That's a really haunting question. And it seems like that's a question that you really dug really deep into when you were investigating the book, um, investigating the case and then writing about it. So how did you go about, I mean, I'm an investigator, so of course I want to know the, <laughs> the actual investigation thing. Um, like how, how did you, like so many cases sort of start with a question that seems unanswerable. That seems like a really hard thing. So how did you, how did you get underneath it? Cause the book that you, I mean, you've, you, you, there's so much information and there's so, it is so well told, which I think is one of the, one of the things that um, is really difficult to do. You do it really well to like take this really complex case and you, you write about it and you write about the people and you bring them all alive on the page. Mm. So, but, and I, and I want to talk to you in a little, in a little bit about the conversations that you had with uh, Julie and Lolly's family and how you bring them very alive. You know, I felt like I knew them and that really felt like a privilege, mm. but just in terms of the investigation from that moment in the waiting for the elevator, when you think, okay, this is not, the story mm -hmm. I thought it was going to be to um, how did you how did you follow the trail the clues towards yeah. towards the truth in this case and I should say not always logically or systematically I'd love to be able to say <laughs> that I could but um, you know I kind of came at investigative journalism through sort of a non traditional way I had worked as a journalist before I went to grad school and then I did a PhD um, and, and the PhD, I think, was really helpful in terms of teaching me different approaches to research. You know, I, I don't use the subject matter hardly at all, but the, the research methodologies, I think, was definitely something um, that I had learned and taken away. As you know, I'm sure all too well, you know, writing about crime is really difficult, especially if the case hasn't been officially closed, because um, what most of us use to get information, which is Freedom of Information Act requests, get denied left and right, especially by the FBI, um, whether or not they have cause. And if a case is at all not settled legal matter, then, then getting documents is really difficult. Right. What was great about this particular case is because it was a federal case and because it had moved all the way to jury selection in the case of Daryl Rice before it was suspended, um, the prosecution and the defense were required to exchange all the evidence they had by way of discovery. Um, so just sitting down with the boxes that I had acquired through the, the um, federal um, depository was more than I would have gotten in most cases, you know, because most of these cold cases have not gone to trial, right? There's never been an indicted suspect. So that alone had allowed me access to, to exponentially more documents than I would have had otherwise. Um, the other thing that I ended up doing, which was just such a gift from, you know, a research perspective, as I eventually partnered with the founder of the Virginia Innocence Project, who was one of Rice's defense attorneys. And she, along the way, you know, and this is where the, the missteps, the federal missteps really start to, to play a part. She, along the way, during the pretrial hearings, realized that she didn't have anywhere near the evidence that the prosecution had and was supposed to have given to her. Wow. They'd be talking about, you know, a report that was a 24 page report. And she'd be like, well, wait a minute, I only have three pages here. Or they'd be mentioning a piece of evidence and she'd say, well, wait, I don't, I don't have that. And so she started kind of sleuthing around and snooping around and eventually discovered that there was a, a pretty massive storage unit. If you think about these self storage units, um, that was filled with evidence that the defense team hadn't seen, um, which is 
almost criminal in and of itself. And she had the good sense to basically buy a copier and a really long extension cord and to hang out in this large storage unit until she had photocopied thousands of pages of evidence, um, which she eventually granted access to me as well. And so in that way, I could recreate what the investigators had done along the way to a level of detail that I think is is really unusual for this kind of work. Yeah, it's completely unusual. And that's a really, really interesting story. So was this something that happened while you when while you were working with her? She no, she got access to it, um, you know, as the case against Rice was going on. So okay. 2004 ish. Yeah. Um, but I, you know, I had a lot of bias against, I think, the work of defense attorneys. And I think in some ways I just assumed that defense attorneys were people who were willing to represent guilty people, you know, and try to get them mm -hmm. off, you know, even though they had done it. And so, and I had also been warned erroneously by several of the investigators that, that Deirdre wasn't to be trusted and that, you know, I was kind of putting my life at risk if I contacted her. And so I believed that initially and I, mm -hmm. I waited quite a while before I reached out to her and then she, you know, understandably wanted to vet me too. You know, I mean, what she was holding was basically, you know, her client's case. And, you know, because he can be brought back to trial at any time, you know, her first responsibility is obviously to him, right? So so there was definitely a kind of get to know you period before she was willing to grant me access to all these documents. Yeah. And it seems so this is dear to end right, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it seems like so what was it like working with the Innocence Project? When it was that got going. Yeah, it's unbelievable. You know, I had no idea about the work of these exoneration attorneys. And this is, you know, part of why I'm so happy to be talking to you, because I know you've you've been down this road too, of of really just understanding the prevalence of, of wrongful convictions in this country and the work that these exoneration attorneys are doing to get innocent people, you know, off of death row is is unbelievable. And it was not something I had any exposure to. And just this idea of, of being in the trenches every single day. And, you know, as Deirdre said to me, basically the only way I can get one of my clients out of prison or off of death row is to prove that someone else did it, right? That's really kind of my only hope. So so she's basically in the, in the business of, you know, being an investigator and trying to solve crimes because that's what's going to maybe save the life of one of her clients. And so watching her and, and her colleagues do that work and watching them wake up every day and be willing to do it again, knowing that they may well end up watching one of their clients be executed was just so sobering for me. It also seems like it 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 was something that you took very much into your own heart to put a, you know, into your own life. Um, and I was really moved by the passages in the book where you talk about the fears that diving deep into this case really, really produced for you. So... Um, I was hoping that you could we could talk a little bit about that. I, you know, obviously as an investigator, I, I know what that feels like. And I know that um, when I was reading, particularly the, the part where after you've, you've uh, been through the evidence, that you feel really afraid for your own safety. I really identified with that, mm. what that journey was for you. Yeah, you know, I didn't set out to be a crime reporter, you know, that was never anything I thought I had the capacity for, you know, and I, you know, I'm pretty susceptible to that kind of stuff. And that kind of stuff, you know, frankly, scares me pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. um, so I had a lot of trepidation going into this project as a book, because I knew the kind of emotional toll, or I, I thought I knew the kind of emotional toll that it was going to take. And I was also really aware of what had happened to other writers who had undertaken this. You know, Michelle McNamara is an obvious example. David Carr, um, one of my favorite writers, Annette McGivney, she wrote very honestly about having what was really kind of an emotional breakdown investigating a murder at the Grand Canyon. And knowing right. my own temperament, I was I was really worried going in about that. And it, it was really emotionally taxing. And um, I don't know if we talk about that enough, about how hard it really is for the investigators, for the writers, for everyone else. How did you, how did you stay sane doing the work? I don't think I did, honestly. I feel like and that was something that really came through um, for me in your book was the, was that 
how you get sort of so inside a case that you end up living it, dreaming it, um, breathing it, I guess. And everything, you know, for the, I worked on my book for the same number of years um, that you did for yours. And it just got to where I was, there was the only, for periods of time, it was the only thing I was thinking about. And mm -hmm. I think that like coming through that and out the other side and like back into the, the sunlit world, I was really kind of amazed that it was still there. Um, I ended up, I, I ended up doing EMDR therapy, mm. which I found really helpful um, because it, it it was a way of time stamping everything and putting it in a file rather than mm. having it, sort of continually re-experiencing it. So I think that was that was part of the part of the the journey for me, and it ended up being really productive. And I think writing itself is also really helpful. You know, the the actual writing of a book, I think, can can help set the story in, down in a way that's that that kind of closes it. And was that your experience with it? Yeah, some. I mean, you know, and I'm sure you can identify with this too. You know, I wasn't able to conclude the book by saying, and so this person did it and has been brought to justice, and you know, that is the end of the story. You know, I I wanted to, and I kept. Um, missing deadlines to deliver the manuscript because I thought if I could just have one more month, maybe I'll be able to actually put this case to bed. But um, right. in that regard, it's still very present. And um, right. Deirdre and I continue to work together on the case. Um, I do name someone who I think is a good suspect, if not the suspect in the book. Um, and we're still working on it. And we're also still investigating that individual for for other crimes as well too, and so in that regard, I think I really do continue to live it um, every day. And you know, I also just know myself, and I know that you know I I carry stuff, you know. And when mm -hmm. I went into this, I had I had set some rules for myself. I said, well, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna work on this book in the dark, you know. I'm gonna watch really bad TV afterwards, you know. I'm gonna for every you know close the door to my, my office. And then I'm going to go watch the bachelor or even better, like bachelor in paradise or something like that, <laughs> like this antidote. Um, and then I also, I thought I was going to set parameters for myself too. I thought, well, if someone offers me the autopsy photos, if someone offers me the crime scene photos, am I going to look at them? And initially I thought, no, I'm not, I'm not going to do that. That's going to be too hard. And then, you know, as I kept going, I thought, how can I possibly say that I'm investigating this case with any kind of rigor at all? If I'm saying to myself, you know, I'm not going to look at the hard stuff because it's menacing or upsetting, or it's going to give me nightmares. I mean, I don't, I don't think you get to do this work and pick and choose like that. So, you know, I did end up looking at everything that was offered to me and, you know, it's, it's stuff that I also know that I'm going to carry around and, you know, never really unsee. Right. Yeah. I mean, you carry them, I think, inside your inside your heart, really. Um, but that makes me want to talk a little bit about who um, Julie and Lolly were when they were alive, because that's something that um, is so I felt after while reading your book and certainly afterwards that these two people who I'd only known sort of the, the most terrible thing about, they became very whole. Mm. And I think that that's something that um, that that felt um, just really, really personal and really valuable. And so, how are who are they to you now? And what was it like getting to know them in this mm -hmm. way and connecting certainly with with Julie's family? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and you know, before the book, I had had that emotional connection to Lolly, so I already mm -hmm. had you know this sort of without ever having met her, I already you know really kind of admired her, and I had seen just how much she meant to people. And so that was really good and really helpful. And, you know, I knew going into this book that that they had to be primary. They always had to be primary. And that was the only way ethically that I was going to feel good about telling the story. I personally, you know, I get the fascination that we have with abnormal psychology and criminal psychology. I get why killers and serial killers are so fascinating. But but I also think that we tend, you know, with true crime as a genre, I think it tends to focus on killers over victims. And it was really important to me to invert that and to keep the focus on the victims and their families and their loved ones. And so when I decided this was a book and not a magazine article, the very first thing I did was I wrote a letter to Lolly's father, um, who has been very... Um, 
kind of public and, and in the media with his desire to have the case solved. And so I felt like he was probably a safe first person to contact because he had been willing to speak about it in the past. Mm -hmm. um, and so I wrote him a letter and sort of explained who I was and my connection to the story and, and why I wanted to tell it. And, and very happily, he, you know, emailed back right away. And we had the first of multiple phone calls where, you know, he understandably kind of, you know, wanted to get a sense of who I was. And, um, you know, we had some conference calls with some of Julie's surviving siblings. Um, and then eventually I, I flew out to Minnesota and spent a weekend with, with him and, and Lolly's mom. Um, and that was incredibly powerful. Um, you know, we sat in this hotel weird conference room <laughs> um, and, you know, her mom had brought family photo albums and her baby book and things like that. And so getting to sit and page through that with her parents and to see this amazing human grow up, you know, in these, these photo albums was really yeah. powerful. And, you know, Julie, you know, Julie grew up in a small Midwestern town and so did I. And, you know, le about 18 months separated us in age. And so as I was looking at these, these photos of these fish fries and these family camping trips, you know, it would have been really easy for me to take the same scene and, you know, substitute my family for her family. And so I really started to feel like I got to know her a little bit and that I thought, you know, our lives really were kind of similar in some profound ways. And I think that always helps create empathy, which is so important in these projects. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's also one of the reasons that the, the tragedy that befell them is so resonant to women, because I think we can, many of us, put ourselves in that situation. You know, the idea of the, you know, the it's not outside of the realm of possibility. And so sadly, you know, that's, that's not a good one. And so I think that's one of the things that, um, that really, that this, that makes the story so powerful too, is that it's this, it, you know, it's a really um, like really uh, principled and direct attempt to, to, to solve this mystery and to, and to sort of have an answer that makes us feel safe to go back outside. Mm -hmm. And um, it, seem, it, it seems like that was part of your journey too, is to, is to take the fear that came from this particular tragedy and to, to turn it into something that could be, um, you know, sort of to give the woods and the wilderness back to, to women. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering what the, what, how that particular journey worked for you. And yeah, also, yeah. also, I wanted to you to talk a little bit about the magic of the woods. I'm not, I'm a city person, you know, <laughs> I, I, I'm much more people on a, on a crowded underground train than I am in a bunch of trees. And so if you could talk a little bit about the magic that's out there, sure. that would be really great. Well, and you mentioned beforehand that you're familiar a little bit with Maine. And so I'm going yeah. to try to you here and we're gonna we're gonna go for a long hike in the woods. <laughs> that would be great. That would it, be great. Is, it is really a beautiful and wonderful thing. But um yeah so okay what was the first remind me of the first part right, anyway it was a, a compounded question to you um is is to talk about the the sort of the safety aspect. I think one of the things that makes this tragedy this horrific terrible thing that happened um so sort of scary for women is that it's not impossible to imagine it you know just like we can we can just put ourselves in that instant and wonder mm -hmm. you know? and so you had to I mean you went to the to the campsite you it seems like that was something that you were brave enough to do and also to experience and and you also continued to to hike and avail yourself of the outdoors so I wanted to talk a little bit about the how you found safety or if, if it's what that journey has been. Yeah. And, you know, when I delivered the first version of this manuscript to my editor, I had done a really good job of not being in the book at all and trying to be this very sort of disinterested reporter reporting mm -hmm. on other people. Right. And she cried foul right away. And she was like, I've been hearing stories of your journey and I know what this has been like for you. And, you know, not only are you doing the readers a disservice by not putting that in the book, but you're also kind of being disingenuous, right? You're, 
you're trying to pretend like you have some kind of objectivity that you just don't have, you know? And so she really challenged me to go back and put the book in its current form, which really does include like a, a first person narrative component of, of me yeah. in it, which I really fought, you know, cause I, I, you know, as a reporter, I, I love to hide behind other people's stories. It feels very safe to ask other people penetrating questions and not have to ask them of myself, you know? Um, and so so the the kind of memoir component of it was was really hard for me, but she's right that it made it a much more honest book because it was, I was terrified at times, you know? And I did have nightmares and I did freak out when anybody knocked on my door and I did you know think a serial killer was out to get me and so I tried to talk about that really honestly in the book I went to gun school and learned how to shoot a pistol which is so antithetical to who I thought I was but right. lo and behold isn't actually and there was a certain point in the book where what had really been fear you know kind of changed to anger for me and I think it really came down to this issue of wilderness access. And the more I started to think about how many people, how many Americans don't feel safe in the wilderness because of their gender or their sexuality or their ethnicity or even just their body shape and their body size, I started to get really mad about that. Like, why, why does the wilderness get to be the domain and the purview of only one set of people, which is hyper fit, attractive white guys. Like, why do they get to go out and have all of these adventures? And so many other people are like, well, I could never do that, you know? And and there was like a righteousness in that anger for me, which, which really started to kind of fuel me and fuels me, I think, right now. You know, I'm, I'm so mad, you know? I'm so mad that the FBI won't acknowledge that it botched this case in multiple, just like egregious ways. I'm so mad that in 2021, you know, there's a huge set of the American population who doesn't feel like they could put a backpack on their pack, you know, on their back and go spend a day or a week in the wilderness and feel secure. Mm -hmm. And so I think that anger has, has really kind of motivated me in a way um, that's let me do work that I didn't think I was capable of doing. Wow, that's amazing. That's incredibly inspiring, actually. Um, and I think it's interesting too the, about about nature in America and in the American consciousness. Like, what what role do you think it plays? Like, why is it important that the outdoors belongs to everybody? Yeah, you know, and when you think of when you go back, you know, to the founding of this country, you know, it was really interesting. I mean, you know, the colonists were terrified of the wilderness, right? You know, if you look at the writings of people like William Bradford and other folks on the Mayflower, like that was evil and scary. And, you know, we even saw that like in the literature of like Nathaniel Hawthorne and people like that. But then we had this sort of like transcendental reckoning, right? Where people like Henry David Thoreau and Emerson and John Muir all of a sudden found this really cathartic beauty to the wilderness, but you know, it really was in terms of like the literary canon, it really was white men who were defining this. And it's mm -hmm. only been very recently, you know, that work by um, scholars and poets like for instance, Camille Dungy, who published a book called Black Nature about 10 mm -hmm. years ago and was like, no, wait a minute. There's actually this tradition of nature loving and nature experiencing that is for black people, which we haven't really talked about. Mm -hmm. You know, so this idea of like coming to this reckoning that that nature has meant different things to different people, I think is a conversation that we're just starting to have. But but as I say in the book, you know, scholarly studies that are just now coming out are still showing just how dominant and um really segregated the way that we sell and talk about natural experiences are, you know, as I say in the book, there's something like, um, I can't remember the number, but the overwhelming majority of the models in advertisements for everything from hiking boots to climbing gear to Subarus, you know, are, are you know, these attractive white men. And so people who subscribe to a different social group literally don't see themselves reflected back in catalogs for outdoor gear for magazines that are focused on it and so you know they kind of sit and, and understandably wonder like well where am i in this you know yeah. i'm say, you know a plus size hispanic queer woman what 
do I get to be in the wilderness? Because I don't see any evidence that people who look like me are there. So am I going to be safe if I go, you know? And until we really resolve that, that equity issue and that representation issue, I think the wilderness will, will, really will feel off limits for people who don't subscribe to the groups of people we see in these ads and these stories. Yeah. And you, and you make that point so beautifully in your book. I mean, that is like, and that's the thing about it is that it has so many different um, threads to it or trails, I guess, you know, you have the crime and then you have your own journey and you have these really profound questions about identity and um, in nature and sort of who we are and where we're going, mm. which I thought um, it just adds so much to what is, you know, is it's on the true crime shelf, but it could be on the philosophy shelf or, you know, the investigations shelf. Um, and I think that 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 that's something that is a really remarkable achievement. And you also really brought the outdoors to life. I can tell that you're an outdoor writer because <laughs> even when, honestly, even when you're describing the, the crime scene, you do it in such a beautiful way that I could almost see, you know, the like the drops of dew on the leaves and the, and the stream that was there. And that was also something I thought that was it was like you bring your your skills as an outdoor writer, your observation skills, to this to this story, which makes it it feel it, again. I keep using the word alive, but it makes it feel very very alive, which also makes it feel so much more powerful. So, as an outdoor writer, um, like how do you do that? That's my question. <laughs> you know, it's, it's it's hard to create a scene yeah. that you know to bring bring just nature itself alive on the page. So. What, yeah. What I mean, that's my first love, really, you know, and I, you know, if I were to define myself, especially before this book, in terms of what kind of a writer I am, I think I'd say I was an environmental writer, you know, and that was really kind of what brought me to all of this. And that's what my, you know, doctoral work was in. And it's also just what I love. You know, I love being in nature. I, you know, I still do a lot of trail running. I still, you know, spend a lot of time in the wilderness, and, you know, which is a wonderful privilege to have. And to be able to, to hopefully kind of share that love and that commitment with spaces and environments and to think about how we all interact with our environments, whether they're built or natural, you know, that was my scholarly work for a while. And so then kind of trying to catch up with the kind of creative writing components, the kind of bells and whistles that kind of add a certain lyricism, that's been my education, you know, mm -hmm. now as a writer, because that's not what I was trained to do. But um yeah, you know, I mean, for me, for me, that's kind of the easy part, I think. And, and, you know, it, it really is true that, you know, when I went to, for instance, the crime scene, which was really kind of a disturbing concept for me that I was going to go to this place where I knew two people had been so brutalized. Um, I thought it was going to feel awful. And I thought it was going to be haunted and scary. And we went in, I think it was the first day of March um, in 2017, I think. And so it was going to be a wintry gray landscape. Um, and I went with both FBI investigators and National Park Service investigators. Um, so I also was really aware that I was in this just group of these, you know, <laughs> larger than life, you know, largely male investigators too. But, but yeah, for me, arriving at the scene where, where these two women had, you know, found this disused trail that was basically off the maps in Shenandoah and they had hiked down and made a decision to bushwhack and found a stream and standing there and just realizing how beautiful it was, was yes. really poignant for me. And it really changed my approach. And as I say in the book, you know, not only as a backpacker would I have thought this is the most perfect campsite ever, but I was just so struck by the beauty of it. And I felt like for a brief moment, I could maybe kind of imagine the thought process of Lolly and Julie when they had found it. And, you know, it was really also reassuring to me to think they spent their final moments in this very beautiful place that they had chosen and, and the place is still beautiful. And I, I think part of why it's still so beautiful is because, you know, while this unimaginable horror had happened there, it was also where these two you know, amazing humans had spent their time and they had chosen it as their place, you know? And mm -hmm. so, so there was something really poignant about that too for me. Oh yeah, absolutely. And it speaks to the power of nature, that nature itself can be so redemptive that it can absorb that and still show the beauty that they mm -hmm. found and that they 
created there. That is really amazing. What do you think in terms of the investigation, um, what's left to do? What do you, you mentioned DNA in the book in a way that I thought was really interesting. And so what, what are the challenges and what would you like to see happen? If you had a, like a magic wand and you could make, you know, have the tests that you wanted and get the interviews that, you know, compel the interviews that are needed. What, what steps do you think? Hmm. I have a very short and concise list, which I regularly send to the FBI, but um, just as a little bit of background. So, so um, the case was dismissed against Rice. If you talk to the investigators today, they will still largely tell you that they believe it's Rice. Mm -hmm. um, the exception to that is that there's a brand new FBI agent now working the case. And, and that person is pursuing some other theories, which I think are really interesting. Um, but along the way, another suspect did appear long before I started working on the book, another suspect did appear. Um, and what I try to do in the book is, is paint as objectively as I can the case against Rice so that readers really can consider that and, and see what they think. Um, and then I try to paint the case against this other individual, Mark Ivanitz, um, and why I think he's a pretty good suspect who requires some more attention. Um, and as you mentioned, you know, I go into the weeds a little bit with, with DNA testing and, and the science behind it. But basically, long story short, um, in the final moments when they were trying to build this case against Rice. Um, the FBI did test some DNA that was found at the crime scene against both Rice and Ivanitz um, using what's called mitochondrial DNA testing, which is a admittedly less sophisticated form of testing than we use now with DNA. Mm -hmm. But anyway, long story short, um, it comes back clearly not a match for Rice in any way, shape or form. It comes back almost an exact match against Ivanitz. And at that moment, and this is one of those moments where I think what had previously been considered maybe just missteps or sloppy work. This is one of those moments where it really does start to feel like malfeasance and, and just confirmation bias to the worst degree. Getting this report back, showing this almost identical match to what at this point is a known serial killer. The FBI says, okay, thanks. And then they say, lab, FBI lab, rerun the DNA against Rice. And at that point, they never run as far as I know, as far as I can tell, they never run any evidence against this known serial killer who had killed other victims in and around the park during this time. And for me, that's just such a misstep. That's just such an indefensible decision based on these just myopic lenses that at this point, all of the investigators were wearing that they were just so sure it was Rice that it was inconceivable to them, despite pretty compelling forensic evidence that they were wrong, they just kept hammering Rice when this other pretty likely suspect, again, had emerged. Um, and so for me, like going back to that moment, you know, and doing what was the obvious right, ethically, not to mention right in terms of FBI policy, which is if a test comes back that close, you must rerun it and you must consider this person a viable mm -hmm. suspect, you know, going back and undoing that back in you know, 2004, 2005 is such an obvious step. And you know, as far as I know, that's never been done. And you know, one of the easiest things that the FBI can do for basically no money whatsoever right now is do what they should have done in 2004, 2005 and run the DNA against this other suspect, who by the way, you know, has been known to have killed three other people who, you know, there was a brief FBI task force in which they were looking at him for multiple other murders across the country. Um, as far as I know, his DNA has never been loaded into CODIS. As far as I know, his DNA has never been compared to some of these other crimes for reasons that the FBI has never been able to explain. And when I asked by way of a FOIA request, I was told that it was not in the public interest to know why any of this was true. And that to me is just an outrage. Of course, this is in the public interest and we should all wanna know and we should all get to know. Do you have a sense that the book will help move that along? I hope, I mean, what I've heard secondhand, you know, from some of the key people in the case is that this new FBI agent is, is really drilling down, um, not as far as I know on this other suspect, but actually on some other suspects, including some of the Rangers who at some point, at one point were suspects in the case. So at least, you know, there is some momentum. I personally don't know if it's the right momentum in the right direction, but I think, you know, any attention to this or, or any of the other 250,000 cold murder cases in this country can, can only be useful. 
Yeah, and that kind of brings me to the idea of, you know, I know the genre of true crime is something that um, it gets a lot of bad press sometimes, you know, or it has a it has a reputation that, and and maybe some of it's deserved. Um, I don't know, but I think there's a there's a, a strain of true crime that your book is in, um, you know, that in cold blood is in mm. that that has like this aspect of just like really like principled, diligent truth telling, you know, and that if the, if it weren't on the true crime shelf, it would be on, you know, major investigations you should read. And so I think that, that, um, and certainly the way that, that you bring Julie and Lolly to the story and to the reader, you know, it's not a, it's not a, a it's not a prurient look at all. You know, yeah. it's, it's saying, this is a case that needs to be solved. You know, it's a case that we all carry with us, I think, whether we know it or not. Do we feel safe outdoors or not? You know, who are we? How are we occupying space? And um, and what can be done? And so I think that's something that um, that that deserves a little bit more thought in terms of, of what role you know, a real investigation like yours plays in the public consciousness. And so I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear that that there's a new take on it and I, I can't imagine that it's a complete coincidence you know <laughs> well we were going to do that you know as journalists that's the one thing that we can do right you know I mean journalists love to talk about themselves as the fourth estate you know which I don't think anybody other than journalists actually talks about and you know certainly the media kind of gets a bad rap right now and we live in this era of like you know fake news and things but but you know journalism you know is a time honored you know, pursuit, right? And and the one thing I think we can do and that we have a moral obligation to do is to shine a light on things that need lights shown upon them, you know? And so, you know, for this, one of the things that I felt like it was really important to do was to show the missteps, you know, to show the bias, to show where, for instance, the Department of Justice and the FBI has really gotten a pass, you know, and where, you know, as as Americans, we ought to be outraged and we ought to be demanding better, you know, and, and you know, if as a journalist, I can call attention to that, if I can get people to care about whatever subject I'm writing about, then I feel like, you know, that's primarily my job, you know? Yeah, I, I totally applaud you for that. Absolutely. <laughs> And so now, now I'm wondering if we have questions or if there's yeah. so We've got a few. So um, Kathy wants to know, um, she said she just started the audio version of the book, Catherine, and she wanted to know um, if you had any input into the narrator for it. I got to choose the narrator. She is utterly amazing. Gabra Zuckman, if you uh, know I'll Be Gone in the Dark, she was the narrator for that. And as soon as I heard her voice, in a sample, I thought, oh my goodness, this has to be the person. Mm -hmm. And uh, holy cow, does she make my prose sound good. I, you know, I listened to the preface of her reading it and I was getting goosebumps and I know how the story is. So I was super, super excited about that. Awesome. And Ellen, you've been so great to lead the discussion um, for us today. Can you tell everybody a little bit about Two Truths and a Lie? Oh, thanks. Yeah. Um, so my book is, um, when I was a young reported for the Miami Herald in 1990, I witnessed the execution of a man named Jesse Tafero at Florida State Prison. And um, my book is about my going back many years later as a professional investigator, I'm a private investigator, to figure out whether he has, was innocent. And it's the story of my, um, I, I go back through the case, um, which was a murder that happened in Florida in 1976. And it's also, as, as Kate's book is, a it ended up being a, you know, a sort of a chronicle of my own experience investigating. I, I too really completely tried to keep myself out of it. And then it ended up, I ended up in it, which is, as you know, kind of a, it's an uneasy experience, but I feel like it's, it was the, the truthful way to do that. Um, I can't so recommend it highly enough, by the way, you know, yeah. I want to join in the chorus of, the New York Times and Marie Clary and other, you know, publications and the NPR, you know, feedback and just say it's just such a fantastic book and so worth reading and considering. Thank you so much. That means a huge amount to me. Thank you. <laughs> and and as we mentioned when we did the bio um, for anybody 
who plays it, follows the Edgars. It was also a be, um, uh, finalist for the best bat crime category for the Edgars as well. Um, so Allie wants to know, she says, as someone with, a, with journalistic experience and training, how could she potentially connect with authors or investigators like yourselves to help with research or make progress on topics and cases like you're working on? Like, is there a way that are like, like networks that help connect people for things like that? Yeah, and there are some really great organizations, um, you know, and subspecialties within journalism too. For instance, you know, I, like as I said earlier, a lot of my work is environmental, so I belong to the Society of Environmental Journalists. But there's also just this fantastic FOIA listserv, which is you know journalists who have either successfully gotten FOIA requests answered or who have done workarounds and have have successfully objected to having their requests for information denied. And um, that's a listserv that is so worth joining, whether you're an amateur sleuth or anyone else, because there are super, super smart people on there who have figured out how to get information that, for instance, the FBI or a state police department doesn't want to give up. And I think that's really a great place to start. And it's been neat to see the camaraderie that's that's happened there. I don't know if, Ellen, maybe you have other sizes, sites and sources that you really like to. I, I can't add anything better than that. That's a really great suggestion. Um, and then so she also wanted to know, so when you're working on something like this, um, in terms of like um, uh, investigation research, how what size team are you working with? How much of it are you doing yourself and how much is like assistance or other people helping out? Well, some of you may have seen the tail of one of my dogs walking <laughs> back and forth like a shark fin. Um, he's on my staff, as, as is my other dog. But no, I am doing this almost entirely by myself usually. I did have the legal research assistant initially, and I did have the incredible luxury of having the Innocence Project team on a case. But generally speaking, it's just me and my laptop, you know, and trying to figure out how to sort through everything. And Ellen, it seems from reading your book that the, you had a fairly similar yeah, it's me. It, experience. I do, but I'm also lucky because I work as an investigator with my husband. And so he was an amazing sounding board. And, you know, as you know, investigating is a lot of exchange of ideas and questions. And two people can read the same things. And, you know, it's like you and your research assistant standing at the elevator going, well, what do you think? That's such an investigator moment. And so it really helps to have somebody who knows what you're working on, who's reading it, that you can kind of trade ideas with. And I was very, very, very lucky and lucky to have that um, with him, my husband. Awesome. Um, and a community of writers too. I don't know about you, but you know, having writers who are friends who I trust to like read drafts and help me figure out where the holes are and things like that. That's invaluable because, you know, this work can feel so lonely and so isolating. And so, you know, I have a group of nonfiction writers here in Maine that, you know, we get together once a month and we talk shop and, you know, trade difficulties and challenges and things like that. And that makes all the difference in the world for me too. Yeah, it really does. Cause otherwise you can end up rabbit holing, you know, just like completely following the wrong trail <laughs> into like the weeds. And so it really so helps. That, that's a great skill of mine. <laughs> <laughs> me too, for sure. <laughs> and it's not bad, you know, you just have to realize when you're doing it and then make yourself turn around. But I think it is really helpful to have a community. Absolutely. So I know it's a little different for you guys than when we're when we're talking with fiction authors about kind of what they're reading. So for you guys, when you're reading for pleasure and you're, you know, trying to, you know, decompress or kind of get out of these true crime worlds, what, what do you turn to if you're reading for pleasure? How about you, Catherine? I love big narratives. You know, I didn't I didn't do an MFA program, which is, I think, what a lot of people do prior to coming to this world. And so for me, I'm always looking at what great fiction writers are doing in terms of character development, plot pacing. Um, you know, a book that I just read that I can't say enough great things about that, that your audience will probably really love is The Christie Affair by Nina de Gramont. And she yeah. takes this very tiny moment in Agatha Christie's life where she went missing for something like 10 days and writes a mystery that I think Agatha Christie would kind of bow down to. And she's got such great characters, such great narrative arc. Reading that and kind of figuring out how you can apply that to a true story is sort of my life's work, I think, these days. That, that sounds really great. I like really, um, I like biographies very much. I like autobiographies. I have a, a special thing, I think, for rock star autobiographies. They're so great. <laughs> like, who wouldn't want those lives? And then um, I also really, the book that I've read recently that I love the most is Piranesi by Susanna Clark, mm -hmm. who wrote, um, it's just, it's, it's, she creates another world that's so real. It's um, it's magical, it's spiritual, it's 
challenging. She's an amazing writer. So I've just, since I read that, I can't read anything else. I'm, I'm just, <laughs> I don't know what to do. I want to read it again. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. So I think that is going to do it for us this afternoon. But to recap for anyone who might have been joined us, who might have joined us late, we've been chatting with Catherine Miles, whose book Trail, One Woman's Quest to Solve the Shenandoah Murders um, has just come out. And we've also been chatting with um, Ellen McGarrahan, whose book, Two Truths and a Lie, A Murder, A Private Investigator and Her Search for Justice is available now as well. If you missed any part of our chat, once we are done, Facebook and YouTube will archive them so you'll be able to go back and rewatch. Um, if you are interested in either of their books, we've got them. I've dropped links to those as well as the other books that they have um, mentioned that they read recently that they loved in the comments. Uh, Ellen and Catherine, so much. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. It's been a real pleasure. It has. Take